Hello everyone, my name is Steve. I'd like to welcome you to my YouTube channel. Um, so I'm going to be going over something a little bit different today. And the reason why I'm doing this video is because I felt like the Google Hangouts I did last night didn't really provide enough explanation for people because mostly they were looking at the other guy's screen and couldn't see my screen. I just noticed that later. But anyways, um, so what I've come up with and I'm hoping for those who are new to this, I'm hoping that this spins off a whole area of people who are interested in designing games. If you've ever seen the Commodore 64 games um, and you're interested in you know, developing your own style of games or learning, just learning about the graphics and how it all worked back in the days, you've come to the right place. Um, I sit there, my, my motivation is to gather people together to try to start building these things and at least give you the information that's possible out there already. I've played with the Commodore 64 computers since ever I've been around pretty much. You know, back in the days when I was young, in the 80s or whatever, I bought my first Commodore 64 computer and I've been playing with them ever since. So I played, you know, I'm, I'm pretty versed in basic and machine language. So hopefully um, you can get your answers here and hopefully this uh, video will get, shed some more light on what's really going on behind the scenes for the Commodore 64. A lot of people always seem like they ask you questions. They don't understand what memory addresses are doing or how to access this or that. So, let's get started. And what what you see in front of here, this is the Commodore 64 mapping the C64 and CE64C. And it's essentially this book right here, just for those who really want to know. What I did is I condensed it into an Excel document which I'll put accessible download for somebody for people later that allows you to instantly see a visual picture of what's going on inside your memory. Now one of the things I've done in this video is I haven't sh I'm not showing every single memory location because I feel like there's a lot of registers out there that are not going to be useful for you for writing software programs or in basic or in machine language. So I've kind of narrowed down the kind of the key things I've found that I've used over the years and as I Continue to learn and evolve more. I'll add more and more stuff to this, of course. But for now, I think it, it's pretty essential to where it is. So let's go over that. You can see right here, the first thing I have here is the, the basic working storage. This is just basically where your basic data is storing, like variables and such things that go into your computer and stuff like that. Um, according to, well, I may be wrong on I'm sorry. So according to this, it's just I.O. ports and stuff like that. But it's not really um, necessary information. Now there's a lot of information in this and this is from I probably should explain this too um, how I've got this um, diagram broken down for you before I come back to this. So this over here these are the symbols these are used for machine language programmers who want to really want to know how to quickly find a value and access it you know inside of a, a subroutine. Instead of having to repeat the data you just type in a uh, symbol and then over here we got the memory addresses now memory addresses think of them as a long row of houses in a row and each house has a number assigned to it and when you go inside the door to each house there's actually a good example in a book but if you go inside the door to each house you're accessing that area of memory so whatever's inside of that door whatever those people can present you with is going to be accessible to you now think of it that there's seven people in the house well, make that eight zero zero to seven people it's a total of eight so if you count zero and the seven you've got eight numbers total but these are the bits basically so think of these people you, you can think of them as people but the computer they're actually bits I'm just using a, a representation to try to kind of explain this to you so when you go inside the house or whatever each person has a particular task that they assign and they can do so we'll kind of go over that a little bit later when we start talking about bits here but for now I just wanted to show this to you so you can see this area right here is pretty self-explanatory this is used by basic most addresses are not useful unless you're building a compiler application I wrote that because this is what essentially people do with this this memory aside besides of this right here and I we'll move on to the next section here but um this also is the hex address to explain the hex address is a hexadecimal address and it's a way that developers came up with a faster way to code data instead of having to use the decimal values and stuff like that it saved them a lot of long typing in of data and stuff like that 
and the next thing here um, is um, this is um, I think I've explained everything here that I could I broke this down into basic code examples too and this this is just basically the description right here you can see it's got the location the description hexadecimal address and the symbol names actually this I can take out because I oh no actually that's right that that's, that's these um, I'm sorry no that should have been over here excuse me I already wrote that up here at the top but these are the symbols so this right here anyway so 139 registers 139 to 143 in your com Commodore 64 is computer's memory or you can see here they're the random function C value this is whenever you want to generate a number between zero and whatever number you want to pull it up so basically a random means it's going to pick a number from the list essentially so that's that's a pretty good thing to get and and what it works is i wrote down here it generates it off of the cpu cpu clock or the software clock in your computer the 6510 you know the processor or whatever the next thing here these are just kernel working areas um this is zero storage page area for the kernel um, again, this isn't necessary, but this is just stuff that deals with the I.O. state, you know, I.O. disk drive, you know, tape, cassette, all that kind of stuff. And then what I wrote here is I have listed several memory addresses below that are useful when writing in BASIC. Um, the reason why I put these ones down here because these are actually good for formatting text or basically centering text on a page or, you know, positioning it where you want it to be. And register 211 actually controls the horizontal position of the cursor and there's an example here we'll come to in a minute and let me zoom in on this a little bit because people might not be able to see this I just don't realize that and the what you do is you set it to a print statement and then the re next register here this is the vertical position so think of horizontal as how far you want it across the screen and vertical is up and down like how far down you want it on the screen and um, I think I might have an example over here need to clear my screen here so and just type it in real quick here to show you what it does and when I run it you'll see it basically position the cursor down the screen and it, it's supposed to move the position over 10 I think I might have to re-flip these. That's probably an example of reason why I did this. I think you have to flip these for some reason. It doesn't like it if you do it the other way, if I recall. Yeah, that's what it is. For some reason, it doesn't like it when you don't flip those. It seems to read them backward or something. Oop. This one right here is just clearing the screen, by the way. So I just need to clear the screen. So it moved it over 10 and it's down 12. So, so you have to print it backward for some reason. So I had to go back in and change that anyway. Okay, so after you got to position, the next thing here um, in memory register is 251 to 254. We got four bytes of zero page for user programs. We're gonna go over these a little bit. Um, a lot of people have been asking me about how to access low and high bytes in memory. And that's what these are for. There are also, you can see I wrote here, these locations I use index zero page address data are useful for clearing the screens quickly, redefining characters, moving data around, and so forth. So they're basically temporary storage area. I use them mostly for pointers, and this is basically what zero page index address allows you to do is set up pointers, which we'll go over soon here. No. The next thing here is the micro microprocessor stack area. Um, these are just registers reserved for the 6510 microprocessor hardware stack. Just I like to say it's temporary storage data. Really nothing important that you would really need to use in there. And the next thing here, uh, this is the basic line editor input buffer. This is just some of the basic stuff. We really don't need to mess with any of this stuff. Uh, the next thing here is a kernel table logical. So pretty much all this stuff down here I wrote nothing important. You can see this one is nothing important for 611 to 620. Nothing important. Nothing that you would use, but rather it's just being used by the kernel processor. Uh, the next thing here is the keyboard buffer. Again, nothing important. But I just thought I would include those so you could see what's really going on there. And to mention this up front, if you want to get a more um, diverse guide or more um, specific, 
you know, where you see more than memory addresses, just go ahead and get the book because I didn't print them all on here. I just put the useful ones on here. So the next thing here we got is the pointer operating system start of memory. And it's been register 641 to 642. I wrote, when the power is first turned on, a code start reset is performed. The kernel routine sets its location to point to address 2048. Um, got a little typo there. This indicates that the starting address for user RAM and basic uses this location to set its own start of memory pointer at memory location 43 and after uses its own pointer. So let me just correct my typo here real quick. Actually my typos, I got two of them here. So essentially what we have going on here these can be used to um, point to the start of memory. This one's the start and the end of memory. This is if you want to um, move basic around, which you won't do this. And, you, and that's only if you feel like you're going to run out of room if you're trying to put too much data in one place. You need more room for a larger character set or more room for sprites or whatever. But anyway, that's used with memory locations 43 in it. So the next thing here, 643 to 644 is the operating system end of memory. And I just wrote here when the power is first turned on or a code start reset is performed. <coughs> the kernel routine RAM TAS performs a non-destructive test of RAM from 1024 up, stopping when the test fails, indicating the presence of RAM. So really nothing really super important, but this kind of tells you what is going on in your system. This one is a timeout 645 with the IEE interface card. So just kind of hardware stuff. Um, we don't really need to focus on it. Now this one is a very popular one. And this is why I put a lot more into this one. And I even, well I copied this from the book. So this is pretty much straightforward. You're seeing from the book here. So this one, for example, is the cursor background color for text. Now if you just go over here and you type in poke 646 comma number, it's going to change the cursor background color for you. And that's essentially all we're doing right there is we're just changing the background color there for you. Okay, so the next thing we got here is, um, these are all the values here. You notice I put in 2 here, and if you go here to 2, you'll see that red is the control 3, or re register 28 is for the CHR value. So the 2 is the poke color, which I just showed you. Now, then what does the CHR value mean? It means if you go in here and you type CHR string, follow one of these numbers. We'll use a different one since we use red already. Let's use green 30. It'll change the cursor text to green. You can see now it's green. And it, these are the control keys that you can press on the actual Commodore 64 key keyboard to change the colors, which I don't have a Commodore 64 example to show you right now, but if you want to look at the Commodore 64, you can see that. So the next thing we got here, okay, so essentially this should be self-explanatory based on what I did here. You can just uh, swap these values out for any colors you like. So Hopefully that makes sense there. And then here's a basic example you can use to change the text color, but I kind of already demonstrated that. And also in this um, example here, I skipped over addresses 647 and 678. You can refer to the book for more information. These again are these registers that are not really essential to basic or machine language. Um, it just keeps track of keyboard routines, the modem, cassette, temporary registers, and so on. Okay, so the next thing we got here, um, this is useful for machine language programs. Now, I had somebody asking me last night in Google Hangouts, you know, what are some of the unused values and how do you know what's unused and what's not. Obviously, the Commodore, Map, Map the Commodore 64 will show you what registers are unused. And I listed them here with an asterisk as we come across them so I can point them out each time. So you can use these for machine language pointers, subroutines, graphics, data storage, and then you might have seen registers 704 to 767 used for sprite data blocks and this is basically doesn't interrupt your basic programmer or whatever. And but data blocks, not to get into those real deep, but that's basically showing you where your sprite data is found in memory and how to point to it to shift, you know, the memory around to find it. So the next thing here is um, I wrote the next registers manage basic error messages, vectors for various routines, etc. Uh, nothing really important, but that's register 768 to 779. 
The next thing here is register storage area. Now this one's kind of interesting. In this area, what it does in this, I wrote here, basic storage this area to store 6510 internal registers, the accumulator, XY registers, and the status register. So before every sys command, each of the registers are loaded with the values found in the corresponding storage address at the machine language program finishes executing and returns to basic with an RTS instruction. The next value of each register is stored in the appropriate storage address. And this feature allows you to place necessary pre-entry values into the registers from basic before you assist to a kernel or a basic machine language routine. It also enables you to examine the resulting effect of the routine on the registers and to preserve the condition of the registers on exit for subsequent calls. Now what in the world does that mean? Um, essentially, narrows down to this, you can take these uh, kernel registers and you can assist use a system here and you can access whatever's going on in this memory location. So this one is this, the screen for printing and allows you to print to the screen in a special way. So what this does is it, it's a position. It, if I type this code in here, which I can do real quick, let's just race our other example here. I'm going to stick this on another line to save some room here. Oops. you'll see what it does. See how position it moved this cursor into the center of the screen and I'll just clear the screen here again to show it to you. So see how it kind of, it did the same thing we were doing with the 211 earlier, but this is a faster way to get the screen position. And this is used a lot in machine language if you ever want to position text and you don't want to have to poke it in the screen memory, this is a good way to do it. And these are the registers. It is, this is the accumulator register. So you have to use them in this order. So 780 affects the accumulator. 781 affects the, end, the X index. And basically this is the vertical position, which is this one right here. So we got it at 10 spaces. And then the Y register is set to at 782 and it's set to two there. Somehow that seems backward to me. I think it's down and over two, but I'll look at that later, but anyways, and the last one is a status register, so we won't go into all that, but that's basically just telling you how to access this and get it to the screen. Okay, so the next thing here, I wrote the following registers use, are registered below are used by the 6510 for the USR command. We won't go into a lot of that unless you really get into machine language, which you really need to know a whole lot about that. Okay, so the next thing here is unused. As we talked about earlier, here's some more. Here's another unused. Well, this is one memory location, so you could use it for, like, again, the express example, data, whatever you want to use it for. But you can't use it for pointers because you've only got one register here. And this one is, um, this is the interrupt. It's called the vector to IRQ interrupt routine from register 788 to 789. And I wrote it here. The vector points to the address of the routine that is executed when it interrupt this IRQ, by the way, is interrupt requests. And basically, it's interrupt requests is what it stands for, short for. Occurs normally at register 5953. At Pyron, the CIA timer B is set to cause the IRQ interrupt to occur every 1 60th of a second. This vector is set to point to the routine which updates the software clock. The stop key check blinks the cursor, maintains the tape interlock, and reads the keyboard. By changing this vector, the user can add or substitute a machine language routine that will likewise ex execute every 1 60th of a second. So interrupts are just basically a way of looking at the screen. It's scanning down the screen here. When it gets to so many scan lines, it's going to stop and you can interrupt the process and you can start doing stuff like you can split the screen and do all kinds of interesting stuff with them. So these are the registers that um, is the high and the low bytes that allows you to poke in the memory locations. If I have time later, like I said, I'll go over those high and low bytes here. So the next thing here is the vector break instruction interrupt. Uh, so nothing really super important. I just kind of put these down for just for people who might want to know about them. And this is the non-maskable interrupt. And these are used with the interrupt, so we're not going to really go into this because we don't have an interrupt example here. So the next one is the kernel indirect vectors from 794 through 813 in memory. This is primarily used by machine language developers to read a disk drive, clear the screen, etc. So really nothing that we would really need. It's mostly just things that's already going on with the actual processing behind the scene. You know, to get your stuff to work, basically. 
Um, these are um, routines for the kernel. This is the get routine. This is um, CLAA routine. I don't know. There's no there's specific example on that one. And this one's a break routine or a defined command. This is a load routine, save routine. So this is basically those things that's allowing your computer to load, save, and you know get the keyboard or whatever. Just do all those things that's necessary to make your basic work. So. The next one here is an, another unused location. Well, here's a couple memory locations from 820 to 827. And I wrote down here, this again can be used for points. Oh, yeah, I put points. Pointers. Machine language data or graphics data. So, good. Good, we got the star going again, so we know that these are good registers. So, the next thing I wrote here is um, from 1000 to 40,000, that's what the K stands for, is 1,000 kilobytes, excuse me, from up to 40,000 kilobytes. This is um, the area that's being reserved for that. And inside of this area, we got the video screen memory area. And this is um, real interesting. Uh, I'll show an example here. We've already got an example here, and I can just use this program to show it to you. And I'll read this description. So it's basically defining your screen. <coughs> your screen is made up of a bunch of pixels. It allows you to print the text characters, everything you see on the screen, which are 8x8. And essentially, this is all stored in RAM. These uh, characters and everything you see is stored in RAM. And you can position this character data and make it, you know, turn on bits that will make it appear somewhere else on the screen here. So. If we type in this uh, program, we can just basically just hard code what we got here already. And just like that, you'll see at the top of the screen, it printed the letter A. So whatever you put into here, it's going to change whatever's in that section. The next thing you do if you wanted to get a different memory location, you just um, <clears throat> change the value and you use a different value and you see it's basically redrawing different data to the screen. A lot of people kind of know about those but I just thought I would include that here. The next thing, I'm getting questions about this. Um, this one, these are called the sprite data, sh sprite shape data pointers from memory locations 2040 to 2047 because there's seven, I'm excuse me, there's eight sprites which is zero to seven and I wrote and this is just being pulled from the, the data from the book. The last eight bytes of the video matrix are used as pointers to the data blocks used to define the sprite shapes. Now each sprite is three bytes wide by 21 lines high therefore it requires 63 bytes for its shape definition but it actually uses 64 bytes in order to arrive at an even 256 shape blocks in the 16 kilobytes area of RAM which the VIC-2 chip addresses. <coughs> and then the next thing here, each pointer holds the current data block being used to define the shape of one sprite, the block number used to define the sprite 0 is held in location 2040, which is the first one here. The value in the pointer times 64 equals the starting location of the sprite shape data table. For example, a value in 11 in 2040 indicates that the sprite shape versus 0 starts at memory address 704. So that's what 11 times 64 is. If you even going on the screen here, you can see it right here. It's 704. And continues for 63 more bytes to 767. But anyway, to those who want to know, a sprite is just basically a defined area in memory where a block is going to appear. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I wanted to show you um, how to get a sprite on the screen here. I'm just going to generate data that's already in the computer's memory here. So I put it at 100, 100. So there's a sprite. Notice it doesn't interfere with the text in the background. I will just go here and you put an 11 and that's basically telling you where it's pointing to. Right now it's pointing to memory location 704. We don't have anything defined in 704 so we're not going to see anything there unless we start drawing to that area. Notice how I started drawing and started drawing on the screen to that sprite because now I'm drawing directly inside of memory. 
So that just kind of shows you what it's doing. Hopefully that made sense. Is it pointing to memory location 704? And now that I was able to access it with the 11, remember times the 64 because this byte data is made up of 63 bytes. Just 0 to 63 for those who want to know. And then this just allows you to define the shape data. And it's drawn them left to right. So basically, essentially, it's drawn first one, second one, third one. It's drawn them three in a row each time. That's why you're seeing different things on the screen. Now, if I change this number, for example, and then maybe go in here and change this number, you'll see different data showing up. See, I put like a little box in the center there now. And I'm just kind of just doing the same thing again here as I'm drawing the screen. Just drawing essentially down the screen in memory. So. That's what we'll do a little bit more. Just to kind of show it to you. Just drawing a little circle thing, I guess. And then we'll just end it with 255 there. And we can just set the rest of them to 255 and kind of draw it underneath so you can kind of see it a little bit. So see how quickly I drew that? Now what you normally do is you define it in data statements when you're drawing a sprite on the screen. I'm going to cut it to show it to you. And like I said, it, you can see it's, it's definitely a sprite on the screen because I can't type over it or anything. Sprite has its own memory area so it doesn't affect the background text. So the next example here is um, registers 2040 through 40,959. This is the largest part of your basic program. All of your basic data is stored here. All the text, everything you see. See what it says there? This is the area where the actual basic text is stored. So if you go in here and you peek into one of these registers, um, I don't know if I erased, um, whoops, I don't know if I still left the program in here, I did. You might be able to see it in memory if you peeked into it, but what you have to do is you have to actually print it to the screen to see it. I think you might have to put it in an AXE format, otherwise it's just going to print numbers, see it's for strings. I think it's CHR strings peak. That value. Um, what was it? 2048 plus L. So it prints this to the screen there. And then I'm just going to. I'm not used to this keyboard at all. Go something like this. That should work. Yep, you see how just now, it's just now printing the text program. This was the program we typed in earlier. So it's basically. It's only getting the text. So it's not showing everything, but you can see it was basically copying what was up here. So it's reading what's in memory there. Okay, so the next thing here is um, character ROM image for the VIC-2 chip when using memory bank zero. Uh, there's nothing really defined about this, so I won't go into this. And this is a little bit more for advanced people, so we won't. The basically, as I mentioned earlier, your text characters are all stored in memory inside of what are called the ROM chips. And inside of these ROM chips, that's where it reads its data. Now you can't read it directly from basic. You have to basically turn it on and off, basically. Because it's ROM, you can't read to it. You have to have basically move it. And this is done with redefined character sets and stuff like that. So the next thing here is the auto stop, auto start ROM cartridge. Oh, and I forgot to mention this earlier when they added this. When you're not using this uh, basic and you're using, like, for example, CBM PRG Studio, which I had running in the background here, you can actually use this memory area to write your own programs. It's not going to interfere with this at all. <coughs> okay, so the next thing we got here is the character ROM. That's from 4096 to 8191. I just mentioned we won't go into a lot of examples on that. Then we got the auto start ROM cartridge, 4032768. Um, this next section is for the 8K basic ROM and 4K free RAM. And inside of this area, I thought what was important to understand is the code start vector. That's whenever you're um, <clears throat> turning the computer off, turning it back on again. It's registering, pointing to these memory locations. These are pointers, as uh, mentioned earlier, about the high bytes. Um, we haven't gone over high bytes yet, but it's basically pointing to a lower byte and then the higher byte to point to what's in memory. So, we were, again, we're just going to peek into those memory locations, which are 40, 90, 60 and 4961 and these are high bytes so with high bytes you're adding them together and multiplying by 256 so this memory address right here 58260 is the data 
that does the, the you see there's a 32 in there if we go in here and we peek into this I'm gonna get a little advanced here just for a minute for those who are with the semi language you'll probably understand this but I needed to pull these bytes out just to show you for a second what's going on here um, since I don't have a monitor I, I, I could pull up the monitor here but basically this is a JSR this is saying this JSR to 83 plus 228 times 256 and what does that mean again you just take the 83 plus 228 times 256 and it's just basically accessing this memory location so whatever data is actually stored there and if you wanted to see that here you could even go up here for example to the monitor 58451 is E453 so this is a monitor by the way for those who are wondering what I got on the screen you probably won't see this some people say they can't see this very well but it points to memory locations that we were talking about earlier you see all these numbers here I don't know if you can see this very well this is what I was talking about earlier when I was showing you all these these values are these are memory locations and this is data that's being stored in and this is what's going on exactly as I'm explaining right here so anyways, if we go to this memory address, which I don't think you can search this thing, so you have to kind of scroll through it like this. And we go to, what was it again, E4 something, E453. There's data that's stored in that memory area. See it up at the top here, it says 64K RAM system. And I know we shut down the other one, but I think earlier you saw it on the screen there. It showed the bytes free, it was reading this memory. so. I won't pull back up again, but if you needed to just go back to the video and look at it. So that's what that's doing. The worm starts doing the same thing, except it's reading a different pointer to a different memory location address. And that, that data you saw me earlier when you saw me do this um, 83, oops, keep wanting to go over here. When you saw me doing this 84 plus whatever and then times 256, that's the high and the low bytes. So you're basically taking the first number, multiplying by the second number times 256 to find out what memory address it's pointing to. A pointer is a way of saying, which part in memory am I looking at now? So I know we went kind of overboard with that one, but anyways, um, I don't think we need to read this, but that's basically what it's doing here. The next thing here, we got Axi text characters, CBM basics. So this probably won't apply to us if you have the Commodore 64 VF CBM, it would. The CBM with a different... Um, that was the old basic, I think it was. Uh, this is from 4964 to 4971. Um, in this book, they don't really have anything else about it because this book is Commodore 64, it's not CBM. Actually, I think I remember CBM was that computer they released later for the Commodore 64. Okay, and then now we got the statement dispatch vector table. Again, nothing real, real important here. Um, and I wrote, I am admitted. I, I am, I think I have omitted everything. I have omitted everything else sit here since it is of use to your basic program primarily, as we were talked about earlier. You can execute basic commands using syscalls to these registers and stuff like that. So, but nothing really big important. Nothing I could really show you, for example, it's very important. The next thing we got here, registers 49 to 134, 49, 151 are not listed in the book, so they get skipped over for whatever they're for. Probably ROM, I don't know. Or not used. Okay, so then we got the 4K area of free RAM. This is from 49, 152 to 43, 247. And this is basically the machine language area that allows you to write programs and such on the, the computer screen here. I'm, I'll do a quick example here. I'm just going to hard code this just to show you um, a simple program I could do here, for example. We'll, we'll simulate something you saw earlier on the screen. So, let's see, 49, 151, just think in here for a second. And 155, comma. Zero. I just created a machine language programming memory, essentially. So if you pick any of these memory locations, you'll see I was just basically writing in those areas. So every time you do a poke, you're storing something into the computer if you can write to that RAM area. If it's ROM, it won't let you write to it. 
But if you know if it's not wrong, then you can write directly to it. So. I need to test to make sure this is correct. So I'm going to just calculate the bytes here again. But yeah, that's right. So we'll just clear the screen here. And then I'll do a syscall. And you'll see something magical happen. Now we'll do a list to show you there's no trick. There's nothing in memory, right? As soon as I go here and I type in sys49152, we get an A in the screen. So I just forward a machine language program that drew an A in the, the corner of the screen. So this is what this area is for. Um, you got a lot of room here. You can write machine language programs as you just saw me demonstrated right here. You can use them for I.O. drivers, parallel or IEE devices, character graphics, and so on in sprite data. So finally get to get into the good stuff. Uh, we've showed this earlier, but this is uh, where all the sprite data and SID and all this is stored. Now I only got it tonight. I only had enough time to just put in the sprite data. Eventually we'll cover the SID maybe in another video or something, but for now, these are the registers that allows the sprite to appear in the screen. You saw me doing some of those earlier. The 4358, this is the horizontal, and I broke this down for people who want to know how the sprite data works on the screen. So I'll put that example back on the screen here since um, it's still in memory. We just basically we did a cold reset as you saw earlier, and we just have to point to the computer's memory again to these registers so it knows where the sprite is again and then we have to turn the sprite on and this is the one that turns the sprite on again so now our sprites back on the screen and you can see the horizontal I put it at 100 100 so whatever 100 you, whatever value you move this to it's just going to move that sprite from left to right wherever you move it to now you can't go beyond 255 unless you do something later called flip the most significant bit which essentially activates the high bit because your screen is not made up entirely your your sprite range or I'm sorry your screen in uh, pixels I think if that's how if I remember how somebody said you've done this um, 8 times 40 I think it was or it's made up of 320 pixels so the sprite data can only go over to 255 since we can only read 255 memory locations I'm gonna get a little advanced here for a minute so what we have to do is we have to basically set the significant bit here so it can pass through the rest of the screen and I'll probably demonstrate that in just a little bit. I just wanted to put the sprite up there to show you for now. And if we could set up more than one sprite here we just have to um, basically if you remember that 2040 register we did earlier and also this I'm trying to print this and I'm over here this register I showed you earlier the 2040 is uh, key to everything this is going to allow us to turn on more than one sprite. Oh, I'm sorry, not 2040. I'm sorry, 53269, which is down here. So let me just change this. Um, I don't want to get ahead, but you'll see this down here. This is basically to enable the sprite. So if we set a three in here, and let me just kind of go over these registers first, and then we'll come back to that, I guess. So we already know this is the vertical, and we'll set an example to put the sprite on the screen here. And I just set them from 0 to 7 because there's going to be 8 total sprites, as I mentioned already. And then this is the, the horizontal vertical and the hex address there, too. And you can see I wrote here setting one of these bits to 1 adds 256 to horizontal position of the corresponding sprite. Resetting one of these bits to 0 restricts the horizontal position of the corresponding sprite to a value of 255 or less. And that's what I was showing you by moving it around there. So we could probably just deal with that for now. So if we move these memory locations here, we can basically just move the sprite around on the screen. And this is the vertical position as I was mentioning earlier. So we could, oops, did that wrong. Now he's off the screen because the sprite, you can see he's kind of at the top of the screen here. If I probably shift this to like 40, you'll see he's kind of like halfway off the screen there. Because he's kind of, he's going behind the border essentially. So the border is surrounding and covering the screen. So here we are finally. So 53264, this is what I wanted to show you. So let me bring this right back down so we can kind of show him again here. Bring him down a little bit more there. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna reset this register 53264 and we're gonna set a bit in here for our sprite um, that's going to allow the sprite to pass beyond this 255. So for example, if we try to go in here and we try to add more to the 53264. 
I'm sorry, if we try to if we try to add a higher value here, for example, you can't because it won't go more than 255 bytes at a time. So to get this to go further over the screen, this is why we do what's called setting the most significant bit. And I'll do it right here, 53269 or 64 comma 1. And hey, he disappeared. Where did he go? If you look here on the screen, what it says here, it shows you. Find scroll display vertically by X scan lines. Now the bits are the numbers I'm putting in after the poke. So this one right here, that's the bit. If I didn't explain that, excuse me on that. So this is set to bit one right now, and bit zeros to two is the find scroll display by X scan lines. Select the 24 bit column display, blank the entire screen, enable bitmap, extend, um, enable extended mode, hide bit of rest to compare register. Actually, this might not be the right one. All right, let me just take a look here. No, that was because he moved, the sprite moved off the screen, so I'm right here, so. So we need to get him back on the screen, so what we need to do is set him back to zero there. And we have to change his horizontal position. So what right, right now is he's at a higher position, so he's basically off the screen, but he's way over here on the right-hand side now. So if we set this to zero, you'll see he suddenly reappeared on the screen. You're like, what? I thought zero was off the screen. Well, it is, but when you set the most significant bit, it can only go from zero to 255. So what it does is it restarts over here again at the high bit at zero, and then now we can start moving him all the way to the border. Now he's at the border. You notice earlier we couldn't do that. Now if we set it to 255, he won't be there. He'll be off the screen, essentially. Because remember, we're just setting that bit. We're flipping that next highest bit after 255. So essentially, he's at register, or he right now he's at location 256. That's what the one is for. Actually, um, that would be 257 because the one is 256. That's 256, and this would be 257. So hopefully that makes sense because again, it's because the sprite um, can only because the screen is wider. It goes from 3, what was it, 320, right here to 255. So essentially what you have is you have 65, as I calculated, you already have 65 plus, 65 plus 255 is the total length that he can go from the, the low significant bit to the higher significant bit. So, I don't want to bash that too much more, because, anyway. The next step here is uh, the vertical fine scrolling and control registers. And I have an example here. I could probably type in this basic program too. So we'll just um, erase this. We don't really need our sprite in the screen. So we're just going to turn them off for now. If we need them. We can just turn it back on again. Oh, well, wait. Before I forgot, I was going to show you the two different sprites. Good thing I remembered. So what we want to do is we want to turn on the other sprites real quickly here. And I'm going to just kind of clear my screen here to make some room. Now we got this guy on the screen. What we need to do is we need to set the registers. As we saw earlier for the 53250, if we remember up here, 53250 is the horizontal for sprite 1, and then 5251 is the vertical for sprite 1. So we just need to basically set that. Now he's already going to have his um, most significant bit not set. He's just going to be defaulted back to the other one, so it should bring him. There he is. Now we got our second sprite on the screen. That's all I wanted to show you on that. So. Turn them back off again, and they'll both turn off. Okay, so we'll just type in this little example program, and what this is, is it's, it's a scrolling example here. So I'm just going to type this in real quick here, try to. I keep forgetting which screen I'm clicking. You could do the other one later. I'm probably not going to do both of them, just for time's sake. Here, and for I equals the keyboard is really weird. If you see me keep backspacing, it's because it's set up to the Commodore 64 computer. It's not set up for the PC computer, so the keys are not 
exactly where they should be. The equal sign is actually at the slash key, so, and I keep missing it because I'm used to typing on a regular PC now on my Commodore 64. So it kind of messes with your brain a little bit that way. Hopefully this works and I'll have to rerun it. Okay, so there you see it. It's a scrolling example. Now it's kind of choppy because you have to add in a wait loop here and that's what they kind of did in this one. It's because the computer itself is, um, it's basically as I was at raster, I was explaining it earlier, when it's updating the raster, it's also doing other things. As you scroll the screen, it's affecting many other different things here on the screen. So at the same time, when you're trying to scroll the screen, the computer's trying to do other things, so it's basically messing with the display. So, which is the next example actually right here. So, read current raster scan line to compare raster IRQ. Just what I was just talking about. So, I'll read this here to you. The raster compare register has two different functions. Just look at some of my typos here. Depending on whether you are reading from or writing to it. When this register is read, it tells which screen line the electron beam is currently scanning. There are 262 horizontal lines which make up the American NTSC, which is the North American Standard Television, I believe it's called, display screen. 312 lines the European or PAL standard screen. So remember those um, horizontal screen lines, those are just going from the top to the bottom. It's basically scanning from left to right, and it sh shuts, off, shuts off the beam here when it's done, and rescans and goes down to the next line, and so on took us to the bottom. Every one of these lines is scanned and updated 60 times per second, so in 60 times per second, it's pretty fast. It does pretty quickly. Only 200 of these lines, numbers 50 to 249, are part of the visible display. So you won't see anything beyond the 249, so if you do that, it'll be basically, I think it's in the border or off in the border or something like that. And it's sometimes helpful to know that just what line is being scanned because changing screen graphics on a particular line while that line is being scanned may cause a slight disruption on the screen. By reading this register, it's possible for a machine language program to wait until the scan is off the bottom of the screen before changing the graphics display. It is even possible for a machine language program to read this register and change the screen display when a certain line is reached. The program below uses this technique to change the background color and mid-screen in order to show all 256 combinations of foreground and background text colors at once. So you're welcome to go ahead and type this in. I won't type this in for clarity's sake, but it basically creates a, a nice display of 256 colors all over the screen using rasters. And there's a machine language example right here. So the next example is only good if you have a light pin. Now I never owned the Commodore light pin. I had an Atari light gun many years ago, but I never owned the actual Atari light pin. But this is the horizontal position, and this is the vertical position, and that's all you pretty much have for these registers. And a light gun or a light pin is just basically a, a, a beam of light on the screen that basically traces where the computer is gonna display data. It basically can be used to draw and stuff like that. Okay, so the next part is a sprite enable register. You saw me doing that earlier, and what you didn't understand though is when I was typing in that 53269, and since we still have the program here, I'll new, um, let me get back over here, I'll new this again, and just clear the screening. So we can get the sprite beta data back on the screen just by typing 53269, comma 1. And then remember, we have to position the sprite back on the screen so we can see it again. And it's going to be not the most significant bit, so it's going to basically center it kind of to the screen again. I think this might be more the center here. And then this is, um, you saw me change this value earlier. This allows us to enable the other sprites on the screen. So as I keep positioning them here, and I'll, I'll, I'll put three on the screen this time to show you. I need to set them all in different locations. If I don't, then they're going to be on top of one another. So, they're 63 bytes apart, so we could probably do 
let's see, this one's at 100, I could probably do this one at like 120 or something and be safe. Oh, I just moved this guy, what am I doing? I meant to do 53,250, 53,251 to bring the other guy on. And then we'll do one more here, and then we should make them all magically appear once we're done here. Do two. I'm setting them in the same horizontal position. And just slightly moving them down the screen here. Now I'll show you one at a time. Now there's the first one. There's a second, and there's a third. You're probably like, okay, they all showed up on the screen, but I didn't see them all at once. I only saw one sprite on the screen. They, oh, they were on top of each other. That's what it was. Okay, I was trying to figure out why. Okay, that's what I wanted to show you. So if we set this one, the other guy, four disappear because it enables sprite four, and we didn't turn on sprite four. I don't know where the other guy is. Um, I'm trying to figure out what happened to this guy down here. For some reason he didn't want to show up. The next thing here is the horizontal find scrolling and control register. Um, we already saw the example of this, so let's skip over that. The sprite and vertical expansion register. So this one's interesting, so we'll go into this one next here, and I'll read this. This register can be used to double the height of any sprite. When the bit in this register that corresponds to a particular sprite is set to 1, each dot of the 24 by 21 sprite dot matrix will become two raster scan lines high instead of 1. So basically it's going to make the sprite larger here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, clear the screen again. And we'll fix our funny looking sprites here. So basically we'll set the shape data back to 255 so it's just blocks again. And then now we're going to go ahead and play with the expansion registers. Now if we set the bits in it to 1, you'll see that now he's large vertically. And remember, we're just setting the sprite, so as soon as we change this, it's going to flip out the other one, because now it's only focused on that sprite alone. It's only focused on sprite 2. Now it's got both of them again. So, you just put it back to 0, and it goes back to normal. The next thing here is the VIC2 chip control register. This is for redefining character sets. I don't have an example here. A redefining character set is taking the data on the screen and changing it into something that looks a little bit more like, you know, whatever you want it to look like. If you want to create your own game maps, you know, cities or whatever, your space, you know, scenarios, whatever you want, you can just change the, the graphics. But you have to move the character set to do that. So that's what this kind of explains here. It's basically stored in ROM and you have to move it to RAM so you can change it. The next thing here is the VIC interrupts flag register. These are just the bits again that control the raster interrupt and we don't have an example here so we won't go into that. But this just shows you the bits and what they control. The next is the RQ mass register. And this is just again what to do with the raster interrupts. But again we don't have anything here so we won't really go into this. So now we're into the sprite to foreground display priority register. So we'll play with this one. To do this, for this to work though, we'll need to get the sprites lined up to show you how the priorities work. So let me get the other sprite lined up here with this one currently. I can't remember which is which now. Okay, so that's that guy right there. And 50 should be close to this guy. I'm going to say about like 80 or something like that. And then we'll drop him down next to the other guy. Oh, he's at 120, I think. You see how he's kind of... Looks like he's, like, behind him right now? That's what this register does. 53275 is going to allow us to see him once we change the bits. Now, this one is set for sprite 1 for the foreground color. And I think I've probably got this wrong. Actually, it's the text is what it is. My, my fault here. It's not the sprite. This is the text. So if we change this, I think if we change it to zero. We might be able to see the text over the other guy. Now he's behind it. That's what it is. So if we change it to one, 
Now you can see him again. You change it to two, the other guy should show up. Now you can see the A showing up through the brown mirror. So that's how you get it to walk behind buildings and stuff like that and kind of, you know, create the effects for that. And I won't read this, this is kind of just telling the same thing. Now we got the sprite multicolor registers. Um, I don't have an example here, but I could probably just load up a program and show it to you. And we'll just load up sprite pad, which is um, an editor you can use on your PC to define sprites here. And then we'll just open up a project here. And if you set this to the sprite data here, this is going to allow the multicolor to come on now. Multicolor, if you see it here, it's got more than one color to it now. So we can change this to something else. And that's multicolor. Multicolor is only, only going to allow you to do four colors at a time. See how I got the gray, which is the background. We got the purple, we got the black, and the green. Because you can only do those four colors in any area of the, of the sprite. You can't if you wanted to do more colors there's some tricks you can do but we won't go into that that would just basically be raster lines and stuff like that so we talked about earlier but that's how you essentially get the sprites multicolor going on and this is just showing the bits for that this is how you enable the sprite multicolor zero one two I could probably do it this one, but I don't know what, if there's no multicolor set, it probably won't do anything, but let's see if I put it to one. Yeah, because there's no multicolor, it's just setting it to black and everything. Because you haven't defined anything with the multicolor yet. The next is the Sprite Horizontal Expansion Register. We saw the vertical earlier, now we'll do the horizontal. See how it got bigger? Actually, let's turn off the um, multicolor. We're also, and we'll come back to that. But we'll um, get the other guy going in. Let's move him out of the way now because we don't need that anymore. So, put him at 255. I guess that'll be good. There we go. Now you can see it. He's kind of larger there. And if we change this, it's going to turn on the next sprite and make him wider. Now they're both wide. And remember earlier, 53271 does the vertical. So now they're just bigger boxes. Okay, and then we got the sprite to collision register. I'd have to set an example program to show you this, but basically, um, it's just going to allow the sprites to collide with each other as they're moving across the screen. I could probably write, since we already got the sprites on the screen here, I could probably just write a simple example program. Might be something more we have to do with it. I think we have to clear it first, if I remember. But we might be able to get the foreground to work. Maybe we can, um... Let's see if we can get the foreground, which is the next example, 53279. Let's see if we can make it run into basic text and then we'll use that um, register we learned about earlier to print it on the screen. I believe it was seven, the 782 one. So we'll position this text on the screen here and we'll try to make it bump into it. Probably have to change this message somewhere. I'll reposition I'm just typing in this text for now to see what it does. It didn't do anything, did it? I set this to three, but I set it to one. No. Okay, the next thing here, you saw me changing the border color earlier. That's basically what that's doing, is just defining the colors that you want to change to the screen. And if we actually go back up to 646, I believe it is, we can go ahead and see the colors that's going to change on the screen. Right here, we use two for red. But they're all the defaults on everything. We want to change it to blue, we use six. Alright, change the text color. 53, 280, 6. And it changed the border to blue. 
If you want to change it to yellow, let me just use seven. So that's all that's for. And these are all, these are actually for the, like the multicolors. You won't see all these, but the 81 is the screen color, by the way. If you change this to one, oh, I can just type it in right tonight. It changed it to white. So it's basically just changed the white background here. And these are all for multicolors, so we don't have a multicolor example to use. Um, So what it is is the text right now is still white. That's why we're not seeing anything over here. Now it's red. Okay, so in addition to that, these are the, um, the sprite color registers. So we'll get our sprite back up on the screen. I have to keep rotating between screens here. Start our background. Remember, it saves those defaults and it never changes those unless you do the soft reset. So we have to go in here and just reactivate our regular defaults or whatever they were. We'll just set this to zero. I guess we'll just set this to black for now. Kind of see it moving in the background there. And then what we're going to do, we're going to change the colors of the sprites here. So we'll peek into these locations here. Or, um, all right, sorry, we'll poke into them and we can change the sprite colors there. And the second one is for the next guy, of course. Now you can see the sprites have changed colors. But this is a demo program I did in machine language that clears the screen, but this isn't a machine language example, but I wanted to show you. This is what I was doing earlier. I was taking the low byte and the high byte, and I was adding these two values together, which is 0 plus 4. You see the example down here at the bottom. 0 plus 4 times 256 equals 1024. And I wrote down here to figure out what memory address is being assessed in the machine language program above. We are going to add the low byte plus the high byte times 256. But I already went over that. I just wanted to show you that. Because since I promised to show you that. So I hope you guys enjoyed this um, little video for now. Um, just wanted to get you guys started and I hope you guys can get started writing your own programs with this example and this is pretty helpful to understanding how the computer Commodore 64 computer memory works and what you can kind of do some of the things you've seen so some of the examples I gave you for example you can position text on the screen now you should be able to create your own sprites you know the collision data well it's there but you'd have to work with it and then you, you've seen all the examples of you know we can basically poke characters to the screen, which you saw all this stuff earlier. So wherever you position this, it's just going to print the data on the screen. So I think you have something pretty good um, to go with. If you want to change the color of this, by the way, you just have to 54272 2, plus um, the memory location. And then you can change that color of the text there. Oops. And just scroll down the screen. Now it's like a yellow. So... Uh, thanks for watching again here, and this is uh, Steve Morrow signing off.